Please welcome our MC for this event, Katrina Devereaux. Hello everyone and welcome to Access Now, brought to you by Free Now in partnership with Irish Wheelchair Association. My name is Katrina Devereaux and I'm delighted to be your MC today at this virtual and what promises to be very insightful and important conference. I am a TV and documentary producer and science communicator and I present RTE's long-running science series 10 Things to Know About. For the past year, I've been involved in a citizen science project called Crowd for Access, which brings data scientists and citizen scientists together to try and map Ireland's footpaths so that people with mobility issues would in the future be able to look at a map and work out an accessible path for themselves, a sort of Google map for footpaths. So in the last while, I've really had my eyes opened to the world of flushed curbs and tactile paving and refuge islands, or the lack of them, and the dire need for universal design for our built environment and beyond. So I'm really excited today to listen and learn from people who are immersed in the issue of accessibility. And for those of you who can't see me, I am a white woman with blonde hair and blue eyes wearing a green and black dress. And I want to let you know that captioning is available for everyone viewing this event and should automatically be switched on when you join. But if you want to turn this off, you can do so in your Zoom settings. This event will also be recorded, so you don't have to feverishly take notes. You can watch it back at your leisure. And if you have any issues throughout the morning's conversations, you can contact ireland.marketing at free-now.com. So to start, I am delighted to introduce Niall Carson, General Manager of Free Now to the left of me. Welcome, Niall. Thank you, Katrina. It's absolute pleasure to welcome all those hundreds of people across the country who are logging in this morning to this event that we've all been so excited about and really passionate to bring uh, this conversation together. Last year, when we formed our partnership with Irish Wheelchair Association, one of the goals we had was understanding the needs uh, around accessibility. And it's certainly a responsibility we take very seriously. As Ireland's largest multimodal provider, we also have the largest fleet of wheelchair accessible vehicles. And it's something that we have endeavoured to deliver a much stronger service over the years. And in the 10 years that we've been working in Ireland, we've seen progression all the way through but it's something that we know we're not done yet and we have a lot more to, to, to continue to deliver on that. I'd just like to thank the panellists that have agreed and then the speakers that have agreed to join us today. It certainly is set up for a really robust discussion on uh, the area of accessibility and we hope that it builds towards building a stronger, more accessible transport infrastructure in Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Niall, for that lovely welcome. And before we get stuck into these meaningful discussions, I would like to welcome Rosemary Kyo, who is the CEO of the Irish Wheelchair Association, who would also like to welcome you to this event. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Katrina, and good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to really thank Niall and all of the team at Free Now for showing such leadership in dedication in highlighting this really important conversation about accessible public transport. And it's really important to note as well, in putting together today's events, IWA members had the opportunity to feed in their concerns and the issues that they face on a daily basis. At Irish Wheelchair Association, we have a vision of Ireland where people with disabilities enjoy equal rights, choices and opportunities in how they live their lives. But what we hear again and again from our members, whether it's access to employment, education, sport, social activity, whatever it might be, that access to public transport, just being able to get to where you want to get to, continues to be a challenge and a barrier to living those independent lives, whether that's in rural or in urban settings. I'm really looking forward to hearing today's diverse range of speakers. And I suppose my call to everybody attending virtually today is to continue this conversation in your workplaces, with your families, with your friends. Create that awareness. Question when you see something that isn't accessible so that we can all move closer to a much more inclusive Ireland. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rosemary. Yes, I think Niall and Rosemary have set the scene of why we are here and what we hope to achieve today and more importantly beyond today's conference and into the future. I would like to now introduce our keynote speaker. In 2012, he sustained a life-changing spinal injury, leaving him with 15% muscle function. But since then, he has challenged the perceived limitations of his situation. 
He returned to college within a year, graduating with a Master's of Pharmacy from Trinity College and Royal College of Surgeons. In 2014, he delivered an acclaimed TED Talk called Fearless Like a Child, Overcoming Adversity. In 2019, he was named one of 10 Outstanding Young People of the Year for his contributions to society and has received several international awards for his documentary, Breaking Boundaries. He sits on the board of directors of the National Disability Authority and Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, as well as the leadership development organisation Common Purpose Ireland. A health professional, speaker and facilitator, he delivers talks, well-being programmes and consultancy to organisations who are committed to cultivating resilient, diverse and inclusive environments where people belong and are valued. Jack Kavanagh, over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome to everybody to this space that we are creating virtually and in this environment where we are all here today. It's often said that our lives are made and marked by moments. As I think back, some of my most cherished moments involved a journey to and from. As a child, the train journey down to Cork to visit Granny, moments connecting families. The journey on the school bus going on a school tour, moments of exploring. The 109 bus for the big day in Dublin, spreading of wings. The taxi collecting you and the friends for a night out, moments of excitement. The bus home from Bus Aurus after a long week in college, returning to safety, to the known. The train to Sligo and transferring to a bus to Belmullet. Access to a summer job access to adventure. Then the big one. I open the door, sit down into the seat, the belt goes on, key in the ignition, my hands at ten and two, knuckles white on the steering wheel, my heart's pounding. The passenger door swings closed, I hear a voice saying, are you ready to go? Inside I say no, not a chance. And yet externally I hear my voice saying, yep, I'm good to go. It's the day of my driving test. 40 minutes later, I pull back into the test centre. I come to a stop. Car in neutral, engine off. I peel my hands off the steering wheel and the blood starts to flow again. Belt off, and I push the door open and step out, as does the instructor. As he walks around the car, he makes eye contact with me and he says, yep, yeah, you're good to go. The elation rises inside me as I realize my newfound freedom. It feels as though I have the world at my feet, access to anywhere. Our experiences of transport and mobility shape or prevent our access and experience of the world, our access and experience to the moments that shape our lives. Today, I'm speaking to you from a place of perspective, perspective of standing at six foot two and of sitting at four foot something, perspective of a before and an after, perspective of having the world at my feet and access to it all, of having the rug pulled out from under me and rebuilding again, perspective of freedom of access and of the barriers that can come in the way. From the moment any one of us enters the world, the environment is shaping us and the extent to which our ability and potential is either expressed or depressed, enabled or disabled. It's only natural then that there would be a diversity of ability, mentally, emotionally, physically. You see, I believe the only thing that enables or disables any individual is the environment in which they exist. The environment legally, 
the environment culturally, the environment between our own two ears, and indeed the physical environment around us. But most of all, I believe in people. And people have diverse abilities over time. When we understand this diversity of ability and we work to create more inclusive, empowering, enabling environments, we strike at the core of what it is to be human, to belong, and yet to have our individuality recognized. By daring to include, by creating access, what we actually create is belonging. We build trust, we garner respect, enable contribution, we both add and receive value. My life is experience of diverse abilities at different times. And that's the reason I believe that my story is just your story written in different words. And there is a before and an after. So I'd like to bring you back to that journey, the train from Dublin to Sligo, the bus from Sligo to Belmullet. That brought me to my happy place. All through my teenage years, I developed an absolute passion for the water and water sports. It led me to training as a lifeguard, to becoming a surfing and windsurfing instructor. And that's how I would spend my summers, working in an Irish college in the west of Ireland, instructing others on the water. I remember on one of my first days down there that summer, cycling off to the beach after work. I remember leaning my bike up against the sand dunes and strolling out onto the sand. And as I sat down a little bit down the beach, I can remember looking back and seeing footprints in the sand. Surveying the scene, I could see the sun gently setting over the breaking waves. And next thing, I caught myself in the moment. You know when you just catch yourself? And I realized for the first time that I could remember that I was consciously aware I was alive. Aware that I was experiencing it all. I realized that I was becoming comfortable with myself. Here I was, almost 20, having answered so many of the questions we have for ourselves as teen teenagers, well, to a certain degree anyway. I realized I was proud of myself for the work that I'd put in to get where I was, having the summer job that I was experiencing. I was looking forward to going back to college the next year into second year of training to be a health professional. But most of all, I was excited about the summer I had and the journey, the travel I would go on at the end of it. Eight weeks later, at the end of that summer, I went away on a holiday to Portugal with seven of my best friends. On the first day, as I'd done so many times that day, that week, that summer, I ran down the beach, dived into the water over a wave, not realizing just how shallow it was. My head collided with the sandbank and in that moment, I broke my neck. My body went limp and I floated up to the surface. My second time of becoming consciously aware I was alive. The following day, I woke up in intensive care. Gradually, I noticed the eight screws in the light fitting above my head. I noticed my head was in a metal cage with tubes going down my nose, a tube going in my mouth, keeping me breathing. And it was at the end of my bed that I noticed one of my best friends, Gareth, walking in. He had this smiling but tear-filled face. I couldn't speak and neither could he but I just mouthed the words, it's going to be okay. I'd had a spinal cord injury. 
I'd had a before and an after. The way that I was going to navigate the world from now on would be entirely different. And yet, I was the same person and wanted to be involved in all of the things that I'd been involved in before. In a scenario like that, you get told a lot of what you will never do. There's a story of a life of dependence. And from the very beginning, I wanted to challenge that narrative. Balancing realism with optimism, the reality, 15% muscle function, my shoulders, my biceps, and my wrists. No finger function or movement from the armpits down. I found myself asking, why me? But I realized after a little while, as important as that question was to go through the grieving process, it didn't bring me anywhere. And so I started asking, why not me? At that stage, I discovered a part of myself that all of us have, and you have it as well. I call it the other self. It's that part we tap into when our back's up against the wall, when things have gone wrong, we take on a big challenge or we're faced with a big challenge in our lives. It's where we find strength that we didn't know that we had. Between the jigs and the reels, I made it back to Ireland by an air ambulance and eventually found myself in rehab, learning to breathe without the aid of a ventilator was my first job. I needed something to pull me through those tough months. And so I set what to me was a very inspiring vision of getting back to college the following year. It seemed a long way away when I couldn't even scratch my own nose. Not only that though, I wanted to get back to my adventurous nature, to exploring the world around me. And 13 months later, I found myself back in college, living away from home. Quite soon, I got more involved in college life than I had been before, and frustration bubbled up inside me. Frustration bubbled up because here I was, back in the world, yet I was bumping up to barriers everywhere. The curbs weren't flat, there was hills everywhere, and that was only the beginning. Steps into buildings, wanting to go on nights out, all of the things that a normal student wants to do were now immeasurably more difficult. My friends were going on holidays and I thought, well, why not me? And so we devised the idea of a road trip on the west coast of America. And we wanted to bring everyone on the journey with us. Breaking Boundaries document, documentary became a reality. Traveling the West Coast, I got access to journeys again. Journeys brought me those moments that we spoke about earlier. Freedom of access to the world, challenging perceived limitations. That documentary aired and then I came back to Ireland back to reality. I remember the week after arriving back on Irish soil, wanting to go on a day out with my sisters on the bus to Dublin. I called a day in advance. I booked the accessible spot. Imagine having to do that. The bus arrived, no accessible spot. The indignity of my sisters having to pick me up and carry me onto the bus. Wanting to keep a low profile, embarrassed by the whole thing, a blogger picked it up and it ended up in the newspapers. I was never looking for attention, but these are the realities that I was facing. I remember another time on a first date, wanting to go from the city center out to the coast for a romantic stroll and having to call on strangers to lift me up in a ch like a chariot and onto the train. 
These are things that we shouldn't have to face, but are a daily occurrence for many people with mobility challenges. But there's a good side as well. There's a side that restores dignity, that it promotes independence. There's lots of good things happening. Over the years, wheelchair taxis became something that gave me access before I was driving again and continue to give me access like on the day that my car broke down on the first day of a new job. Wheelchair Taxi that brought me to the screening of the Breaking Boundaries documentary, challenging perceived limitations. Days like today, Access Now is a small key that opens a big door. It shifts the perspective. It challenges leaders, but it not only challenges leaders, it challenges each one of us to rethink how we can make improvements for mobility, for access, for all. All people are asking for is an equal opportunity to engage in and contribute to society. By doing that, we have an increased sense of belonging for all. We recognize people as individuals. We restore a sense of purpose and meaning. 75% of individuals that sustain a spinal cord injury, just like I did, never work again. Huge proportions of this is not because they're not qualified for the job, but that they can't get there. Nobody wants to be dependent, but it's true that all of us are interdependent. In the disability field overall, 30% of people work compared to 70% of those in the rest of society. 30% of people. When one fifth of people at some point in their lives will have a disability of some sort of or other, you start to realize that inclusion is not only the right thing to do, but it's good for business. The reality is, is that life can change for any one of us in a moment. What kind of workplace, community, services and country would you like to experience? Because each one of us has a role in co-creating that now. We are doing well. For example, 20% of Freenow's taxi fleet is accessible, but it's not enough. We can do better. We must do better. Designing for access and inclusion is good for business. It's good for reputation. It's good for societal impact. Now is the time for initiatives like Make a Move, a time for leaders to step up. Access now is a statement of intent and has the potential to be a beacon of light for other parts of the transport industry. It's inspiring to me that Free Now chooses to be a leader in striving to create access to journeys, access to moments, by shaping an environment centered around inclusion, awareness, understanding that builds connection, empathy, and compassion. As we touched on earlier, celebrating and becoming inclusive of all abilities engenders trust, it builds engagement, it creates a sense of belonging, it demands an improvement in communication. In business, it drives retention, cohesion, but most importantly, it connects us to each other, to society in a more human way. Just like nature, it's our diversity that makes us strong. You've had the bravery to begin tuning in today. Now I wish you the courage to continue the journey as together we create Access Now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jack.
If this was an in-person conference, you would be basking in thunderous applause, so we can only give you a little mere patter. But thank you for sharing your story and your, your lived experience. Um, and it really is a great scene setter for our first panel discussion this morning. And beside me to get into all that Jack has just set up for us, we have Fiona Brady from Free Now, Ray Coyne from Dublin Bus, Alan Parker from Bus Erin, and Elaine Howley from Sage Advocacy. You're all very welcome and thank you so much for coming here today. Um, I suppose Jack has just highlighted, you know, what a bad transport experience looks and feels like. Um, but we're going to try in this discussion to highlight best practices in terms of accessibility and, you know, what inclusivity looks like and what, how it can be achieved mm -hmm. everywhere. But before we get into specific examples, I think it's really good if everyone knows where <coughs> people are coming from. So Fiona, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us why you're here yeah, today? Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Um, hi everyone, my name is Fiona Brady and I'm the Head of Operations and Public Affairs for Freenow. As Niall mentioned, Freenow is Ireland's leading multi-mobility app and we're delighted this year to have partnered with uh, IWA to work on improving transport and more accessible options. Uh, transport for me is the moving force behind every community community and we, we need to serve that community responsibly so by investing in technology and the physical infrastructure we can make improvements and make that happen. Great. Ray, how about you? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I'm Ray Coyne, CEO of Dublin Bus, uh, largest public transport provider in Ireland. Um, Pre-COVID we had carried 140 million customers. Uh, last year we carried 70 million customers on essential journeys. Um, we do that uh, on a thousand fully accessible fleet, um, three and a half thousand employees, uh, and working and engaging with the communities that we serve. Um, the, the, I suppose the, the proudest part of my role is that it's public transport and, and public transport is for everybody and should be accessible to everybody. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, Jack has outlined some uh, areas where we do need to improve upon and hopefully through the debate today we'll get to see some good initiatives that have been there and what we really need to focus on in the future. Brilliant, thank you. Alan Parker. Good morning, I'm uh, Alan Parker. I'm uh, Chief Customer Officer with Bus Aaron for the last four years, so responsibility for the service delivery function. That's everything our teams do day in, day out to deliver for, for our customers. I think Bus Aaron, 2,700 employees throughout the, throughout the country. Uh, we operate over 1,000 1, vehicles uh, and 200 and 250 odd, odd routes. I think in pre-COVID, carried 89 million, uh, 89 million customers in a year. And I think sort of just to give a, a, a feel for the sort of the reach of Bus Aaron, but 95% of the Irish population is within about five kilometres of a bus iron, a bus, iron bus stop. We run look, a wide, diverse network. We have our city services, Court Limerick, Galway, Waterford, uh, rural stage carriage commuter services. We also run expressway intercity uh, services. And then we administer the Department of, uh, sorry, the school transport scheme on behalf of the Department of Education. And for, as a business, very, very focused not only on high quality, safe public transport services, but making sure they're accessible, accessible to all, irrespective of age, uh, disability, uh, mobility issues. I think. Uh, Jack in his keynote speak, the speech did sort of highlight issues where it didn't work and we're very focused on making sure that doesn't happen uh, and that we understand the, the challenges that are there for, for our customers and that we address those and make transport accessible for everyone. Great. And Elaine, will you introduce yourself please? I'm Elaine Howley. I've had impaired vision since birth and I've spent my whole adult life promoting independence and advocating for access access to education, access to employment, access to information, cultural activities, social event, full participation for people with disabilities. But core to that for anybody with a disability uh, is, is public transport that's uh, available, accessible, reliable um, and barrier free. Um, I, I am somebody who completely relies on public transport. I don't drive a car. I can't decide to cycle to work today because it's a nice day. Um, every day I use public transport in my job. Um, and I, I represent people with disabilities on a number of, of committees, including the Department of Transport's Accessibility Committee. Um, I know that increased funding has gone into public transport. I know there are an awful lot of pub, um, positive initiatives. But I also know from people with disabilities that the the, the, the day to day experience is not necessarily improving at the same rate. So safe spaces like footpaths, physical access, 
uh, it's, it's, it's not improving in line with the, the funding that's going into it. So there's a, little, there's a mismatch that needs to be resolved. Well, let's maybe drill into that a little bit later. But I may start first by kind of getting a sense of mm -hmm. achievements that have been made in recent years. So, Ray, do you want to give us a sense of what Dublin Bus has done to make its fleet accessible and its services accessible? Yeah, so if um, I've been in Dublin Bus for 33 years and we're 35 years old uh, last week. But <laughs> if I look back on, on when I started out in Dinebrook Garage, um, we had a route timetable, route number one. And there's about six times in that timetable that were in red font and everything else was in black font. And that was uh, a wheelchair accessible bus. Um, and that was in the late 90s. And people used to, like Jack said, people used to ring to make sure that that bus was going to be on at that time. That, and it was the only bus route in Dublin. Um, so a decision was made back in the late 90s that we would only buy low floor accessible buses um, as the industry was starting to produce these. So that took 12 years to implement into the fleet. Um, but we did it at the start, uh, not knowing, well, you know, the reliability, how the, the buses would function. Um, but what quickly happened then was customers got to use the bus because as you roll them out into routes, customers use wheelchairs, um, customers, you know, temporary ambulance, um, they, they would then get on the bus. And those customers then said to us, listen, it's great that I can actually get on the bus now. But now when I'm in the bus, you know, the hand poles, the hand poles are just steel hand poles. Um, there was no space for the wheelchair. Um, there was steps at the back of the bus. So people, you know, there was only about seven seats downstairs that were accessible. Um, so we engaged with the community, started making some changes in the interior of the bus. And that was your bell pushes, your color contrasts and hand poles. Um, what happened then, the next step is, well, the drivers are now encountering customers that wouldn't, wouldn't have encountered before. So, you know, the customer feedback was, look, you need to have your employees clued into our requirements and, and how we would go about using your service. So we put a training program in. We had, we had a disability activist, Dermot Walsh. Um, I, was, I was an accessibility officer in Dublin bus and uh, I toured many parts of Dublin with Dermot. Um, he actually gave our courses on disability uh, and inclusion in the workplace. Um, after that then, customers who'd never used the bus and who may have acquired a disability um, or were starting to learn how to use the bus, we had to teach those customers how to actually interact with our service, again, through feedback in the community. And then probably the, the proudest thing I think I, I have in Dublin Bus in terms of what we do now is the Travel Assist programme. So uh, a lot of people tuning in would know Roger Flood. He's the, he's the main man for that and he has a team behind him. And that is where we will go out to a customer, teach them how to use the service, whether it's the bus, the Lewis, the train, um, get them comfortable using public transport. Um, and the reason I tell that story is you have to start somewhere and then you start learning what the next iteration is and the next iteration. So as I look back now, fully accessible fleet. So all the infrastructure on the bus um, is there. We have to put in some induction loops now and that's the next stage for all buses. Um, but how we go about that, it has to be community into the organisation, not the organisation telling the community what to do. I, I don't have the lived experience, but I do have empathy and we do communicate. And, and what we did see was the community were open to engaging with us because they saw that we were making some changes. And then they knew, I didn't know at the time, they knew they would lead to bigger changes. Then what you have is the, out, the infrastructure, the bus stops weren't accessible. And there's a lot of work that's required to be done there. And we, you know, the councils have done some good work. Now you're involved in a lot of multi kind of agency stakeholders. And again, from, from my point of view in Dublin Bus, the closer the decision makers are to the end users and the customers, the more effective the decisions tend to be and the faster they tend to be. And I think that's super important as we look at the massive change that's coming with infrastructure and the technology. This is a new cycle again. And so I think that aspect needs to be cherished that the end user is you know, face to face with the decision makers. And, and for me, that was me in Dublin bus and you go out and meet the community. So, um, so we have made some really good strides and, and I think there's a lot, still a lot of work to do, obviously. But I think once you make some intervention, you get to learn so much more and then you can build, build upon that.
Yeah, great. Um, Alan, do you want to give us a sense of Bus Aaron's achievements in the last Yeah, I, I think probably similar to Ray, I think that if I pick maybe three key items, I think that the investment in the fleet is is key. We're now, you know, even last year, we took in 202 new uh, mm -hmm. vehicles into the fleet, all fully accessible. Uh, so that now has got us to a point where we can uh, sort of increase the number of services that we're marketing and, and advertising as being fully accessible. So all the, all the city services, all the town services, low floor, fully accessible. Our coach fleet is now fully accessible as well. Uh, so look, I think that, that really has made a, a, significant, uh, a significant difference. On board the vehicles, again, that work of, uh, of understanding the challenges that uh, the customers have. So making sure there's suitable space around the wheelchair, uh, the wheelchair area. Uh, voice announcements, we're rolling out voice announcements to, we're about 50% of the fleet completed. Hopefully the rest, the, the whole fleet by the, by the end of this year. But again, helping, helping those uh, with, with, with vision, I'd say helping every single customer but with those with uh, sort of vision impairments as well. So that's been a, a sort of a, another key uh, key initiative. It's interesting, Ray mentions the, the travel assistance scheme. We're now going to trial that in Cork and, and learning from the success that, uh, that, that the scheme has been in, in Dublin. So again, supporting uh, supporting people who, who want to use our services and, and help them. And, and I think by sort of communicating that, uh, hopefully they'll find actually the strides and the improvements that have been made. And it's maybe not as difficult as maybe uh, some perceive, but uh, we, we do still have a, uh, a lot of challenges. I think the other side, significant investment in the, the infrastructure. So making our bus stations accessible, making our, our bus stops accessible. So uh, again, uh, the, the NTA have committed 12.5 million investment over the next five years to us to, to work on those accessibility issues. So again, that will, that will help us uh, address a number of the challenges around, around our stops. And I think that the final piece where we've really improved is, uh, is listening to, to our customers. So understanding what are the challenges they do have using our services, how do we address those? Uh, and you know, there isn't one single bullet or silver bullet, it's lots of small issues that we're, we're picking up from through our, we have a, a user group, uh, again, just listening to, to that feedback and saying, honestly, well, how can we really address those issues and, uh, and, and improve the situation and make it as accessible as possible. Great. And Elaine, when you think, when you're hearing those initiatives that have been in place, is there anything, like through your work with Sage Advocacy, but also with your previous role with NCBI, are there initiatives that stand out for you as successes or ones where you go, oh, well, that, you know, really needs work? Um, there are a huge number of successes. I mean, uh, Ray mentioned the 90s was a big turning point. I think uh, transport providers really started listening to uh, disabled people and engaging in with us. So I was personally involved in a, a lot of the work with each of the companies around uh, audible announcements um, that started probably in Irish Rail, I think, um, with Dublin Bus, the whole area of colour contrast. And, you know, we, we had a new livery that was made, made buses physically really, really visible. Um, we had yellow bus stops, we had yellow poles inside inside the buses. Um, and with Lewis, there was, there was lots of engagement uh, slightly after they picked an inaccessible colour for the outside of their fleet, but they, they subsequently rectified it somewhat with a, a yellow line around a stripe around the, the side of it. Um, and subsequently, since that, engagement has been huge with them. Um, Bus Erin uh, equally like uh, transforming their stations that were, were quite inaccessible for many years. And I am delighted to hear of audible announcements improving on Bus Erin because I spent many hours wondering where I am and stopping people who are getting on and off to ask them, where are we now? So uh, that's, that, that's all good news. Mm. Um, I suppose engagement is, is, is huge. Uh, you know, there are where, where you can rely on things like, uh, you know, it just really straightforward examples, lifts when they work, audible announcements when they work, ramps when they work. But the, 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 the worry is and the concern that people always have is, well, when they don't work, is, is their commitment, and it often happens, is their commitment to maintaining, maintaining and repairing things as they don't work and doing that quickly and retaining what is working. So, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, a, a constant uphill battle to hold on to the things that are working as new developments emerge. You know, are we suddenly faced with, you know, at, at one stage we were we were shown new buses that had 45 shades of grey inside the bus and no colour, no colour contrast um, 
Now, fortunately, that got changed, but it was an uphill struggle to change it. And it also cost a lot of money. Like these things don't get retrofitted uh, cheaply. So the key really is engagement with disabled people at the early stages, at the planning stages, before decisions are made and really listening. I think that's key. Um, and it is improving, but could could continue to improve more. Yeah, because I think, you know, those it's the reliability that you know that there's a lift and if it's not working, it could mean you going home for the day or somebody going home for the day. Whereas, you know, and I think that's uh, something that you hear a lot from people in the community. Yeah, or not turning up to your meeting. Like the impact on lots of people's lives and lots of people's days is, days is massive, you yeah. know, when, when things go wrong. Yeah. And also, we all love the Audible announcements. They help everybody. So, like, why not have them? Um, <clears throat> um, Fiona, in terms of um, Free Now and your um, provision of the largest wheelchair accessible fleet in Ireland, um, which is brilliant, but will you give us a sense of the um, taxi industry in general? And, you know, what are the policies in place and, and are they actually working? Yeah, sure. So, um, as Jack mentioned, we're at about 20% of our fleet is wheelchair accessible now. Um, it's a bit lower across the country, but um, there is a policy in place since about 2010, which means all new uh, vehicle licenses have to be uh, wheelchair accessible. So 10 years on now, we can see obviously that as you know, a prime example of policy having um, an impact on, on the industry. But I think again... Slow though, isn't it? It's very slow. So we need to look, we do need to look beyond that. Um, and we looked, at, it kind of strikes me when we're talking about this and everyone's different modes that it's not just one mode. We all have our bits to do and it has to be a collaboration. So for, you know, anyone to have the freedom to 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 live their lives, to, to go to meetings, to socialise, mm -hmm. um, you need to have access to all these modes. And, you know, taxi is an important one as well because it's, it's on demand. It's like, it's when you want to go out, it's when you want to socialise and I know there's still the night link where it's back now, isn't it? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, is. but um, it, it is a really important mode. And what is important is that we start like harnessing the, the technology to, to kind of bring these all together. And, you know, um, together having all those modes accessible will actually improve reliability overall in a transport system. And do you, Ray, do you think technology is one of the key things for inclusion? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, as we come into the new technology, that, that, that kind of life cycle of change is going to happen again because we're going into areas that we don't particularly know yet. But I think one of the key points, and, and Jack mentioned earlier, it's universal design. Mm. So what we're looking at now in terms of technology is just make it as easy as possible. That's what technology should do, make things easier to use. Um, if you can do that for everybody, that's great. You don't have to segment it out and say, well, listen, we'll make it really good for here or here. Just make it good for everybody and you're going to have natural benefits. So I think... As, as technology and public transport merges, what, what, we, what we definitely need is um, absolutely simple fare structure or simple ticketing system to navigate and book journeys and, and stuff like that, right? So, um, and then you've got the multimodal. So that's mobility as a service in the industry. So mass, um, that's where the industry uh, is certainly going to go. How far it goes down would be down to the regulator, down to the government in terms of their aspirations. But what you can have is all the public transport operators and private industry working through one simple app and then you choose what mode you want to do, how much you want to pay. So you might have, I'll choose five bus journeys, six bike journeys, I'll walk here, I'll choose a train, I'll take a free now taxi. And that will give you the best price combination for you. Mm -hmm. um, that will then assist the city as we look towards sustainability so and, and accessibility. So. For, for me and Dublin Bus at the board as a CEO, it's what is accessibility? You have to define that. And if it's physical access, that, that's a very narrow view. So we say, look, is public transport accessible to everybody? The stats are up there around job, um, people who are active in jobs at 30% of you have a disability. Um, and the stats are there around the uh, earning income. You need to make it accessible from a price point of view and then they can access the service and then they can get another job. Um, so that's something that we need to look at. What's the price? the physical aspects of it, and then you've got to make it super easy to use. And that's what's come true here. Like, it's, it's not easy to use the whole ecosystem. Yeah. Technology can deliver that if it's planned correctly, if everybody's engaged in it, and if we take on board everybody's points, as Elaine said, at the design phase. And then it's just, look, this is good for everyone. So that's where I see technology hopefully benefiting all users. Yeah, so. I'd agree with Ray, actually. I think access, accessibility has to be 
from design from from day dot and it's you know all these things sustainability accessibility you know safety gender all these pieces they don't progress in silos so you know really you have to consider everything when you're looking at and financial inclusion as well so when you're looking at you know sustainability have you considered accessibility have you considered the price point and um, but it is that collaboration that that's required but then who is responsible for driving that you know like alan who's going to be the person that says like when you think of all the hurdles that need to be overcome what are the key challenges and how do you bring everyone together i, I think as, as everyone said is sort of working in collaboration with all with all starting with the, with the users and then all the all the key stakeholders who need to deliver this i think you know maybe to, to pick a Key, you know, a key challenge for us is that infrastructure piece. I think you know people get hung up on the vehicle. We're now 100% accessible. Dublin bus is slated 100% accessible. We're seeing more accessible taxis, but it's the infrastructure going around that to enable people to use it. We, uh, as a from from a bus airing point of view, 5,000 bus stops throughout the country. At this point, we're probably about 1,300 are are accessible. So that's probably a key challenge for us is is, is working with all the stakeholders to improve the accessibility at each of those stops. And that that is a that is Job not going work. to happen yeah. overnight. And and I think the the as, as I mentioned the funding from the NTA twelve and a half million that's really welcome. Uh, but with that number of bus stops to book, to to make accessible. Um, that'll need to happen if we really want to achieve the goal of making public transport accessible to everyone, everywhere. Uh, and again, we can see the benefits where where users. You know, a good example in Sligo where we had a, a customer who who. Would, New accessible buses within accessible bus stop was able to attend Slag YT, complete their their course, and it really just just uh, it, we can all see the benefits. But I think it is uh, it is that challenge of there's uh, you know getting everyone working on the same agenda and the the investment going in. I think even when we have that that, that investment, even specifically in bus stops, I had the opportunity myself with uh, Spinal Injuries Ireland to to spend the day in a, in a wheelchair and use that on our services to just uh, experience firsthand those key challenges. And I have to admit, it was uh, it was just it was enlightening. And say so we can you know, we can hear the feedback from from our customers, but when you experience it yourself, it is difficult. And I think it's for me. It was the, the learning was well. How do we make even the simplest thing that little bit easier? I think someone touched on it earlier. Even getting to a bus stop, and then there's a little lip on the curb, and I struggled. And I spent I spent about 12 hours. I went out to, to Navan, even getting around Navan, and just the, the, that infrastructure piece, bus stop, curbs, pavements. It is uh, we have so much work to do uh, to 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 really. Uh, make everywhere accessible. And that was 12 hours, you know, 12 hours. try and that, I, I, 3, 6, 5. No, 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 yeah, it's, and, and no but it's I, really good learning, yeah, isn't it? It was, and I think that's where we found that, that sort of the opportunity to do that. It, it, it really helped, uh, I suppose, focus focus me, focus us as a business as to, as to really we need to work hard to, I think we're making great strides. We are making improvements, but we do have a, we do have a long way to go. Yeah, Elaine, the, you know, there was um, Free Now carried out a survey with Irish Wheelchair Association members in advance of this event and 38% um, said that better education and disability awareness of drivers would make Ireland's transport network more accessible. And in general, in the public, 24% agreed that greater public awareness would, would uh, in terms of, you know, pay, uh, passenger etiquette would improve the public transport system. But do you think that, do, does that chime with your experience? Is it, is it about awareness? Is it about Alan getting into a wheelchair and like wa walking the walk or not walking the walk? I think awareness awareness is is huge. I think training is is still massively required. Um, at the moment, um, my understanding is that that in certain areas, people have training uh, when they when they first acquire, say, taxi drivers a, a taxi license. Um, I would say taxi drivers need ongoing training. Any customer facing person in in service delivery needs to update their training regularly. Um, and I, I think part of that needs to be really listen to the people, you know, they're engaging with. Don't don't assume that you know what a person needs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, ab absolutely. I, you know, it, it, it's, it's key. Awareness training is awareness and and training on how to deliver your service best to, to customers is, is essential, yeah. And in the wider public as well, because I mean, I think, you know, it's everybody's responsibility to call out things that they see that are not accessible or like, do you think there's a lack of awareness within the wider public? I think there's a huge lack of awareness in the wider public. I think there's a huge lack of awareness among, of, among policymakers. I mean, everybody's journey begins at home. 
So if you need to go to a, a, a bus stop or a train station or a Lewis stop, you know, you need to get to that place. Um, you know, I have walked around without a care in the world, knowing that I can see most things well enough for years. Now I'm experiencing a huge level of anxiety, which is new because policies that involve shared space mean that I am now in danger and have had lots of experiences of either being mowed down by bikes and scooters or almost being mowed down or tripping over new barriers that are appearing to separate cycle tracks from the road that just happen to be the same colour as the road so I can't see them. So I've had so many tumbles, near mus misses, uh, interchanges with cyclists telling me to get off the cycle track when I'm actually on what used to be the footpath for years. Uh, it's just not working. It's it's huge lack of lack of awareness among policymakers who are going along with this. And and I I know it's it's well intentioned, but it is not helping older people. It's not helping anyone who lives with a disability. And it's really increasing anxiety levels. Some people are staying at home. Some people are resorting to using taxis that are very expensive because the taxi will pick them up, the, up at the door and they now don't need to navigate any of this difficult uh, terrain. Um, so yeah, there's a huge piece of work. Um, you know, I, I see ads on telly about um, mo motorists keeping away from cyclists. I would really like to see the same going into cyclists and cyclist behaviour in relation to pedestrians because if a pedestrian doesn't have a safe space, where are they? that the footpath should be a safe space and, and that has been eroded. And, and policy has done that. So it, it has introduced a whole new layer of difficulty for people who already have difficulties getting around. Yeah, and that was probably done without proper consultation. There just wasn't enough people at the table to give the opinions to go, have you thought about where well, I'm going to go? Yeah, I mean, I mean, part of getting funding for things is, is, is having to take a box that says you consulted, but consultation isn't an end in itself. Consultation needs an outcome and people need to be to be listened. So there need to be positive to be listened to. There needs to be positive outcome from consultation. It needs to actually make a difference rather than tick a box that says, yeah, we met them. You know, mm. it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, there needs to be action. There's no point talking about it, you need yeah. to do it. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, like, we're kind of coming to the end now, but, I, you know, I don't want to say a post-pandemic because I don't feel things are entirely over, but, you know, we are um, hopefully emerging from a pandemic. We are reimagining how we plan our cities and future in terms of addressing the climate crisis. We're going to have a huge investment in public transport in the coming decade. This is kind of a once-in-a-decade opportunity for us to do things right. So I might say to you, Ray, considering that so many people use Dublin bus, but what do you see in the next five years in terms of how the travel network will change in the next five years? Um, well, we, talk, we touched on technology. Um, people's journeys are going to be much more fragmented in terms of they'll use a lot more modes um, and that, that's, that'll be their aspirations and their desire. Um, I think from a policy point of view, huge investment coming, so crucial for the economy, so crucial for the city and the people. You need to design everything into it very early because there'll be no rowing back from it so it'll take 30 40 years to undo it so um i think I, I mentioned earlier it's for me it's empathy and engagement try and understand seek to understand what all stakeholders want you, you look at universal design so it can be done if you get that at the early stages then as elaine said the policy makers and, and everybody comes together and say look this is what we're going to set out to do now set down the targets as a ceo of a company you have to have targets you have to treat them seriously and that's when you'll get things done. And so I think once you set that out, but, you know, people have to take the time now to say, is everybody comfortable with what we're going to do? You can't meet everybody's needs all the time, but you can meet the vast majority, get it done right, and then say, OK, is everybody behind it? And then full steam ahead. You do need the policymakers to really understand. And that's why I made the point earlier. The people who understand and get the most efficient decisions, and generally the best decisions, are the ones closest to the customer. They must be listened to, and that engagement needs to take place now. Great. Mm -hmm. 
Does anyone else have any final thoughts that they'd I like to I think maybe just, just on, on race point, I think that what will the future look like? I think and Fiona touched on that fully integrated public transport network, you know, whether it be sort of, the, they talk about the first mile, last mile, whether it be taxis mm -hmm. into public transport. I think how we, how as a society, we put that together and say that, you know, that it is fully integrated. It is seamless for, for whoever is using public transport. I think that you know, we all know the benefits uh, public transport brings uh, in, in sort of social inclusion. I think that that's the future we need. How do we, how do we get mm -hmm. it really integrated? integrated and seamless and and I think that's uh, I think with the investment in connecting Ireland bus connects everything that's going on the opportunity is there mm. and I, I think that is what we're we're working towards I describe that as choice so if you can offer a choice and like every member of society should be able to participate fully and transport actually can facilitate that I think you're all going to be very busy for the next five years trying to deliver all of that and I have no doubt that you will because, you know, it's a rights issue. Everybody has a right to get to where they want to go safely and um, thank you so much for um, teaching me about it and um, and I hopefully um, sparking some thoughts and um, inspiring people to, to make the effort and to create the awareness and to put themselves in the shoes of other people. And um, yeah, thank you so much to Fiona, to Ray, to Alan and to Elaine. Thank you so much. Um, so now we are going to take a quick five minute break. You can rest your eyes, look out the window, make yourself a quick cup of tea. And when we come back, we'll have our second panel discussion of the morning. Thanks so much.
Please welcome back our MC, Katrina Devereaux. Welcome back to Access for Now. I hope you've had a nice little break for yourself. And um, yeah, this panel, second panel discussion is going to be looking at um, more day-to-day -day life and um, issues around workplace and employers' accessibility and all that kind of thing. Um, so I just wanted to introduce everybody firstly, and then we'll get introductions. I'm joined by Joan Carthy from Irish Wheelchair Association, Christabel Feeney from Employers for Change, Paralympian swimmer Patrick Flanagan, Maeve Monaghan from Now Group, and next to Maeve we have Fergus Sharp from Dublin Chamber. Um, so Joan, do you want to just give us a little, will we do the same thing, we'll have a little introduction and find out where everyone is coming from? So will you start for me, please? Yeah, sure. I'm the National Advocacy Manager with Irish Wheelchair Association, and I suppose my first introduction to um, disability was when I had um, a road traffic accident when I was 21, so over 30 years ago. Um, and I got involved, I was a co-founder for um, Spinal Injuries Ireland. And in that space, um, I suppose there was a lot of roles that I played, but a lot of it was working with um, people who are newly injured and their family members and trying to kind of give them the the understanding of what it was like to, to live with a, an injury. And I suppose really for them to see what the possibilities were um, to live with a, an injury. Um, I worked there for about 20 years, um, but really felt that there was more I could do if I could work, um, I suppose, on the bigger stage, looking at policy, trying to influence policy and make changes um, there. And that's where my work began with Irish Wheelchair Association. Um, about six years ago. So I suppose in, in this arena, um, I sit on um, the um, access board, the, sorry, the transport um, access committee um, with the department. And I also would be um, on other user groups in relation to transport. So I'd have a wide, um, I suppose, knowledge of um, transport, not from a user's point of view only, but kind of the policy side of things and looking at seeing what way things are changing. But I suppose for today's um, piece, it's really kind of looking at trying to look outside the box. Um, we keep looking at what needs to be put in place in relation to making the um, the buses accessible and all of those, you know, and trains accessible. But it's actually the step beyond that. It's the impact that access um, to transport has on employment, education, um, and all the other pieces of, um, I suppose, life and how we interact in life. Yeah, have fun, sports, yeah. all those kind yeah. of things. Um, Christabel, will you give us a little introduction about where you're from? Yes, of course. As you said, my name is Christabel Feeney, and just to give a phys physical descriptor of myself, I'm a white female with long blonde hair and blue eyes, and today I'm wearing a black turtleneck top and skirt. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm the Director of Employers for Change at the Open Doors Initiative. We're a project that's funded by the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, and we launched in March of last year. So our purpose really is to act as a support and advice service in the area of disability inclusion for employers around Ireland. Uh, and we would give advice to employers on things like reasonable accommodations, um, the supports and grants that are available through the Department of Social Protection to them, um, and other things such as conversations around kind of disclosure um, when somebody comes within the organisation and shares with a colleague or an employer that they have a disability and how to approach those conversations and ensure that you're acting as a support to that individual throughout their, their, their work cycle or life cycle within the working environment. So we do a lot of work in the area of disability awareness training with employers. We have a helpline as well um, that employers can use free of charge if they do want to access any advice or information. And all of that is on our website, employersforchange.ie. So it's great for us to be involved in the conversation today. This is a wonderful event. Um, and as Joan mentioned there, you know, accessibility, it goes across the board. It's really important for people. We're talking obviously predominantly this morning about transport and access to transport. But there's such a knock-on effect from that into other aspects of people's lives. Be that economic inclusion in terms of, you know, the workplace environment and access to work, but also the social aspect as well. And actually being part of the social, social fabric of society is important for all of us as individuals. So thanks very much for having us here today. Yeah, well, we're delighted to have you. Patrick, will you give us a little introduction, please? Yeah, so as you said, my name is Patrick Flanagan. I'm an Irish Paralympic swimmer. I've been lucky enough to travel most of the world with my swimming. I've competed at two European Championships, a World Championship, and then the Paralympic Games in Tokyo last summer. I grew up in Longford in the middle of Ireland, so I had to go through that change of kind of moving out of rural Ireland and moving up to Dublin and dealing with that acclim acclimatization to the city, which was something quite easy for so many of my peers my age who didn't have to deal with the challenges of being a wheelchair user in the city. And that kind of opened my eyes to 
life, you know, in the city as a wheelchair user and kind of what needs to happen and what needs to change. Great. Um, Maeve. Yes, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Maeve Monaghan. I'm the chief executive of the Now Group, based or, or born, as I say, in Belfast, but working across the island of Ireland now. And we support about 1,200 people with um, intellectual disabilities and autism into jobs with the future. And I'm really keen to be here today because we're talking about a jam card initiative, which was set up really by our participants who decided that one of the reasons why they didn't access their cities and their towns or in, in many cases work was because they just couldn't get there or they didn't feel confident to get there. So I'll talk a little bit more later about Jamcar, particularly in relation to people with hidden disabilities and that aspect around customer service. Great, thank you. And Fergus Sharp. Sure, I'm uh, Fergus Sharp, Head of Public Affairs at Dublin Chamber. We're the representative body for businesses in the greater Dublin area. It's a very wide, diverse membership base, everything from sole traders and small startups to large multinationals and uh, semi-state companies. What they're all united by, though, is a vision of Dublin that has both business competitiveness and quality of life uh, at its core, understanding that those two things are really complementary. Uh, mobility and transport is absolutely key to that. And we've been strong advocates for more investment in public transport and improvements to our transport infrastructure for uh, a long time now. But in recent years, the conversation has really shifted in, in a, I think, a quite focused way to broader improvements to the public realm in general and making sure that public transport, as well as our streetscapes in general, are accessible to people with all levels of mobility, ability or disability. Um, so delighted to be here today. One in seven Irish people, according to the last census, or at least the 2016 census, has some kind of a disability and well over a quarter of a million of them. That's a, a substantial physical limitation of some kind. So it's really important that we're ambitious about this um, if we want to create an inclusive labour market and an inclusive economy and society. Great. Well, listen, it's wonderful to have you all here. I might start with you, Patrick. You talked about that um, quintessential Irish experience of being a culture coming up to the big smoke and the challenges that that faced. What, is it, what was it like for you adjusting to Dublin? Yeah, so like it was obviously very tough. My first real experience of it was when I was 16. I was in transition year in school and I had just gotten this great work experience in the centre of Dublin and I was obviously really excited for it. So I kind of sat down the week before with my mum and we figured out my big week in Dublin, you know, how I was going to get up and down to Longford each day and how, what time I was going to get on the train. I was going to get the train up to Connolly and then the dart into the centre. And luckily, my mum is the kind of person that will not leave anything up to chance. So she made sure she came with me on day one and our challenge just started straight away almost at Longford train station when we had to go chasing people to try and make sure there was a ramp there for us. And um, I realize now you're meant to book the train in advance, but none of my siblings have disabilities. So that was nothing my mum had dealt with before, which is quite frustrating. That's something I would have to do just because I'm in a wheelchair. So we got up to Dublin and then once again, had to go find a ramp to get me off a train and we try and take the dart and it's just not happening. There's no way for me to get on the train. So luckily we were asking public people beside us just to help lift me and throw me up there. And it was really just, degrading and frustrating because I realized really quickly that my big week in Dublin wasn't going to be my week in Dublin. I wasn't going to be independent. For the rest of the week, my mom had to go back to work. So it was a case where I was organizing with cousins of mine who were already up in Dublin that they were going to meet me with some of their friends, ride the dart with me, lift me on and off. And I realized I just had no independence to this great adventure that I wanted to go on. I still had a great time on work experience, but there was definitely this overhanging frustration to it. And then a couple of years later, when I went to college, I moved up to UCD and I had quite a negative perception of what it was going to be like getting around Dublin. And luckily, I realized there are some things that do work, you know, realizing that I can still get the bus into town with my friends. The ramps that fold out, there are some positives and these are good things. But the challenge is, is the consistency. So, for example, you know that you're going to get a wrap onto the bus, but there might be space when you get on there. And that's why so many people with disabilities are so frustrated, because there's these protocols and there's these expectations and there's great, great stuff on websites about how it's going to work out. But it's just not always the case. So you might even get a dart that's meant to be a wheelchair accessible station, but you get there and the lift doesn't work. And you're just, you don't take that risk because the trust isn't there. And until we get that level of trust and that level of consistency, I don't think we're going to see people with disabilities taking public transport regularly. 
Yeah, God, it's it's so difficult. Like when you, you know, you should be just going to work. You should be mm. having a great time. You should be going, I'm going to Google to play the yeah. foosball tables at my break or whatever people in Google do. Obviously much more than that. But I suppose like Joan, he's painting a picture for us about how many challenges they are. But like in terms of employment and workplaces, like what are the misconceptions that employers have about hiring people with disabilities? Yeah, I think um, as people with disabilities, I suppose, have been portrayed very negatively um, over the years in relation to employment and education and what their capabilities are. Um, and in many cases and in most cases, people with disabilities are well able to take up employment um, and work alongside their peers at the same level and the, the same pace as they can. Um, I think there's also a perception that if um, an employer looks to take on somebody with a disability, there's a huge amount of cost to that. Um, whether it's putting in uh, reasonable accommodation so they might look at having to change their premises or whatever. In a lot of cases, especially with the, the newer buildings, you know, a lot of the, um, the, the, the structure is there already, it's fine. And most people only need small adaptions. And there are grants out there as well. There's government grants out there that people um, or that employers can um, apply for to, um, to help in that. So straight away, I think we're on the, the back foot with employers because they think it's going to be a big deal to take on somebody with a disability rather than them bring them as far as the interview, having that conversation, figuring out what it is that somebody needs um, and then working to find the best way to, to work it. Because the other side of it is that what's coming across um, in statistics is that people with disabilities, when they are in employment, they, they're actually out sick less um, because they have that drive, they want to prove, um, they'll, they'll turn up at work even when they're, they're unwell. Um, so there's the whole other side of, um, I suppose, the, the positive impacts that people can have, not only on the actual work that they do, but on their peers around them. Yeah, and obviously, clearly, problem solvers and able to work in tricky situations Absolutely, all the time. Absolutely, we're, because we're solving problems every day of our lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Christabel, I see you nodding along there as in, with your organisation, Employers for Change. Like, is that is what Joan is saying? Are you hearing that similarly? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would say uh, one of the biggest barriers for employers is lack of maybe understanding and lack of knowledge. And when you don't have an understanding, you don't have knowledge of anything, you're always fearful of it. So I think that employers, as Joan said, there's a little bit of fear there, um, you know, about the unknown, um, maybe not understanding what kind of reasonable accommodations might be required. And like, as Joan mentioned there, the accommodations often don't even have a cost. So in the last couple of years, AHEAD have carried out research and they found that actually two thirds of the cost, or two thirds of reasonable accommodations requested to employers had no cost at all. And then the the other one third actually had minimal costs because they're often available within the organisation. So it comes back again to us when we, we think about disability. Are we understanding the diversity of disability itself? Are we understanding that you can have visible disabilities, but you can also have hidden disabilities? And even for the employers out there who might be working, let's say, in an environment like a listed building or something that maybe right now isn't wheelchair accessible, that doesn't mean that you can't be inclusive of people with disabilities. There are also other disabilities that people are living with out there. So it's really getting the employers to understand and be more confident and be disability confident in themselves that actually they they feel that they can be inclusive and that they understand that there are things that they that all of us can do on a day-to-day -day basis to be more inclusive of people with, with disabilities within our organizations and do you have examples of like what companies are doing right yeah i suppose the first thing i'd say to that is people always ask us you know have you got um have you got a gold standard of what an organization is doing and i'd always be cautious with that because Companies are, are doing lots of great work, but there's no one organisation doing it perfectly because this is a very diverse space that we're talking about. We all have different needs as individuals and people with disabilities are the same. They all have very different needs and have different disabilities and there's huge diversity in that. But some of the examples I would give, one that jumps out is the likes of Bank of Ireland who've been doing a lot of work. Um, they've introduced what's called a reasonable accommodation passport within their organisation. It's a document that was put together by IBEC and the Irish Congress of Trade Unions a couple of years ago. And the 
idea is that there'd be this kind of live document within an organisation where a person can raise with their manager that they have a reasonable accommodation need. And this document goes with that person throughout, the, throughout their time in the organisation. So if, for example, they were to change roles or their manager changes, they don't have to consistently ask for that accommodation. That now stays with that person and it creates kind of a, an open discussion and a process. So Bank of Ireland have actually introduced that for all staff across the board. So for example, let's say you're somebody who's primary carer for an individual. You can now go and ask to have your working hours adjusted. So it really shows our employees across the board that accessibility and inclusion, it's good for everyone. You know, so what, what might be effective in, in the initial term for people with disabilities is effective for everybody. Yeah. Um, and the only other example I'd give is the likes of Salesforce. They have been really good in terms of the creation of their job specs. So again, they include in their job specs, they include information around the physical environment, where the, so where the job has taken place, so that a person has a very clear picture on application of the type of environment they're going to be working in, and also the physical movement requirements of a role. And I think that's really helpful for people when they're applying for roles that there's no ambiguity that they have a full understanding of the requirements related to it. Yeah and it's building it into the culture it's like we do this here we think yeah. about these things. Um, Maeve what do you what you, your job is all about supporting people with intellectual disabilities and autism into jobs for the future so what do you think we can do to be more inclusive of people with intellectual disabilities? I think Part of the solution is, is the events like today where we start to talk about it and we talk about the opportunities rather than the, the problems all the time. I suppose I reflect in being in this industry now for, for nearly 20 years and seeing the difference in the conversation that's happening more recently. You know, in very early days in Now Group, it, it, it was really difficult to encourage employers. You were doing it one at a time. And the concern I had at that time was that when they were looking at appointing somebody with a disability, it, it nearly was a CSR piece <laughs> rather than the right person for the job. And I think that's changed because the labour market has changed and businesses need really good people and they need, they're starting to realise the business case of diversity and inclusion. And I think that conversation has opened up something something new so you know we're finding that businesses are particularly interested in disabled people as a, an amazing group of people that can add value to their organizations I think sometimes um, as the previous speakers had said so, uh, uh, there's just a little bit of a fear of getting it wrong so they don't do anything and and and, and lots of talking about the examples of things that have worked really well from an employer's point of view and also from a, a, a staff point of view, definitely helps break down some of those barriers and, you know, helps businesses get on with it. Yeah. Because it, I haven't heard one employer that hasn't said that it's been better for business in the longer term and that it not only does it make it more inclusive of their customer base, but it's just primarily good for business. And it's also just the right thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a no brainer, yeah. really. Um, they just, it's that piece around getting going. And, and the support that's required to do it well and make sure that we tell the stories about where it's worked and fix the problems if it hasn't. And tell me about the jam card and how that fits into kind of helping with this awareness. Yeah, well, I suppose that's probably one of the, the main reasons why, why I'm here today, because, you know, as we'd spoken about um, before, there's, there's quite a significant um, amount of people in the population who it's not very evident that they have a disability. And... Um, access to good and ser goods and services can be um, limited by just a fear of not getting it right. So the jam card started off with a group of our participants with intellectual disabilities and autism who were particularly nervous about getting on buses. So when we asked them, well, wh why aren't you accessing the city? Why aren't you going to jobs? The fear of getting onto a bus just limited everything. And that was, I always um, use the example of if you're going to um, a country that you've never been in before and you can't speak the language and there's all of these norms mm -hmm. that nobody ever tells you. There's no guidebook that tells you this is how you ask for um, a seat. This is how it works when you get on. That's all just assumed. And for some of the participants that we were supporting, the fear of getting that wrong just, just stopped. So the jam card stands for just a minute. So I think it's a perfect example of a, a, a product, a really simple solution that was designed by people who needed it themselves. I didn't realise that it was a problem. I would have never come up with that solution, but our participants did because that's what they needed. And all they asked for is just a minute. It just stops at that point of fear and says, just give me a minute. Might take me a little bit more time to say where I'm going or get my money out or get, 
but that's okay. And and I think that's what's been amazing with her great support um, from uh, Free Now and Bus Erin and um, Dublin Bus. And that's rolled out across the transport network across the island of Ireland. Uh, 95,000 jam card users now, and that increasing every day. So I think that shows the spending power of people with disabilities. And I think that changes the conversation with business. Yeah, big time. And Fergus, what, what Maeve is saying there and what elders are saying, is that kind of chiming with what you're hearing from your members in Dublin Chamber? Absolutely. I think Maeve is right that, uh, you know, businesses, the, the labour market is changing. So businesses are very keen, I think, to really take on board all the fantastic talent that is out there, including people with all sorts of different mobility levels and abilities and disabilities. And often the misconception isn't necessarily about whether somebody would be able to do the job. It's about whether, you know, us as a business, whether we would be able to accommodate them. Um, and as Christabel says, I think, you know, a lot of the job we have really is about raising awareness of the support that is out there and um, the fact that there isn't necessarily an outlay involved, but that if there is, there are fantastic supports out there at the moment that could really make a real difference. Um, I'm going to talk about just one or two of them by way of example. Uh, one that I think probably all businesses should be aware of because it, it could be almost universally applicable is the support scheme for disability awareness training, right? Which is very simple, just helping staff and management understand uh, how disabilities work, the different kinds of disabilities that, uh, that there are, giving them an overview of anti-discrimination and equal opportunities legislation. Um, doing perceptual awareness exercises to sort of dispel some of the misconceptions that people have. Um, that's covered by uh, the government in a grant that covers up to 90% of the cost of that um, over a number of years, up to a maximum of 2,000 euro or 20,000 euro, I beg your pardon. So it's, it's quite, quite substantial. Um, and if something happens in employee, just thinking of the really moving story we heard uh, earlier in the last hour, um, if something happens a, a key employee or indeed an employee at any level in an organisation, in any occupation, uh, there's a grant available to help you retain that employee in the role that they were in. Um, and that's a two-stage process. It involves getting in an external specialist to develop a specific strategy for that employee to help them be retained. Um, and then a, a second stage of support is uh, implementing that strategy. Um, so that could be hiring a job coach, training or retraining the employee to deal with their the role now in the context of their disability or potentially retraining for another role within the organisation. Um, and again, most of the cost of that will be covered by the grant that's available. There's also supports available for workplace equipment, adaptation of the workplace, whether that's minor modifications to buildings, you know, uh, ramps, uh, different bathroom facilities and so on. Um, there's a huge amount of support out there. So I think raising awareness of that uh, would really help to open things up and, and allow businesses to take advantage of all the talent that is out there. Or even just simple things of businesses putting on their website and social media. We have an accessible toilet, we have a ramp. You know, these things, we're here, we're open and ready to accept everybody. Come, <laughs> spend your money with us. Like, Joan, do you think... Um, I kind of think I know the answer to this, but you know, what is it that need that we need to do? Is it tighter legislation to compel people to do things? Is it greater awareness? Is it like a revamp of the physical infrastructure? Is it all of us? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought that. Yeah, was yeah. There's so many um, things I suppose that really needs to be done. There does need to be tighter legislation. Um, there's um, obviously we have the 6% quota that's after being brought in for um, public bodies, but that has to be or some type of quota has to be brought into the, the private sector as well. Um, I think it's, I suppose, just kind of pulling a couple of things together from what we were we were talking about. And obviously this is a, a transport um uh, conference. So I suppose looking at the transport and the employment side of things, I mean, they go hand in hand, but I think it's everybody's responsibility in relation to transport and not taken away from the government because absolutely that's where it sits with. Um, but we also have to look at kind of what's happening in rural Ireland. And no matter how well our infrastructure is, there's going to be so many people that transport's not going to reach to. So it's all about the employers and the companies looking at how they can play a part in actually getting people into their companies um, to work if they're living in a rural um, in a rural setting. We've all seen how well it works to uh, work remotely for people um, with, with disabilities, like everybody else is doing it now. So that's kind of bringing people with disabilities now into the, the workforce, it's opening it up to them. 
but it's not to say that we want people with disabilities only working from home. So it's how those companies can maybe get involved much more in that transport discussion beyond today um, to see is there anything that they can do to open it up, especially if they are in in rural settings. So it's it's a much bigger piece than just saying it needs to be more, you know, kind of stronger legislation. It's a bigger conversation. Yeah, yeah. And Chris, well, what, what are the positive impacts that come to businesses and communities when they are more inclusive? Yeah, so look, I know it's been mentioned here about the, the positive business case for it. Um, and like we're talking about a community globally that's over one billion people. And when you're taking into consideration family and friends, the disabled community has a spending power of 11 trillion euro. So that's a huge market share of our communities that businesses need to tap into. Um, but as well as that, the Deloitte carried out um, their diversity and inclusion report in 2020, and they found that companies that had a truly inclusive culture, they were eight times more likely to have positive business outcomes, they were six times more likely to be innovative and agile, and they were three times more likely to be high performing. So there's such a strong business case. Um, we've all talked here about the, the abilities of people with disabilities. We're talking about people who often have to navigate life in a much more complex way than the non-disabled community. Um, and as a result, they're fantastic problem solvers, brilliant organisers. And so this is really a talent pool of individuals that as employers, we can't, we can't afford to miss out on. Uh, and from a community perspective, I suppose, look, economically, there's obviously the knock-on effect of we have people in employment, they have access to money. Um, it you know, means better physical and mental wellbeing for people. But a huge part is that element of social inclusion. And we've all learned over the last kind of 24 months from maybe working remotely, that need for feeling like we're part of something, that we have people that we're going to speak to every day and the social aspect of actually being included in the workplace is huge for people. We carried out research at the end of last year looking at the impact of remote working during COVID-19 on people with disabilities. And of course, it can be a much more um, attractive opportunity for people with disabilities because obviously access to transport, that issue is, can be removed if you're working remotely. But what we can't forget is it shouldn't ever be an alternative to providing reasonable accommodations and it shouldn't be an opportunity for people with disabilities to be isolated from the rest of the workforce. So there's a real need as we move into this kind of new world of remote and hybrid working that we're consistently connecting all of our staff, all of our employees, both those with disabilities and without, that we're connecting them together, that we're ensuring that we're providing accommodations, that we do not assume that our work or our home lives are equipped to act as our office or our workplaces, and that we're providing things like captioning for all of our events, and that we're asking people, do they have an accommodation need for their continuous learning and development within our organisation? Great. And listen, Fergus, I, we're kind of running out of time, but just very briefly, you know, we, you spoke about supports that exist already, but what are the other key policy areas where there needs to be, we need to do better or where there needs to be improvements? I think something that the Chamber has been campaigning on over the last uh, year or two in particular has been the vision of the 15-minute city. So designing Dublin as a city in which within 15 minutes of active travel from your home, whether that's cycling, walking, wheelchair use, you've access to all the key facilities and services you need for local living and to support the local economy, getting all that integrated into local authority development plans, and we're seeing progress on that. I think leveraging the National Development Plan, which is the biggest capital investment program and in infrastructure in the history of the state, making sure that universal design principles are integrated into all those developments from a very early stage. And I suppose the third thing maybe would be uh, harnessing new technologies in a really targeted way, like mobility as a service, making sure that government and state agencies maybe engage in a proactive way with mass providers to try and develop solutions for the kind of transport mix we're hoping to see in Dublin uh, over the next kind of few decades. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's brilliant to hear that there's so much, and um, you know, in progress and in train and I think the next 10 years will probably be quite transformative says she optimistically but um, Patrick I might leave you with the the last thought of the day no pressure but you know what do you think um, as a young person what would you what do you want people to take home from today's conference yeah I think it's just that like disability is such a broad word and then consequently so is accessibility so if you're sitting at home today and you want to get more involved in accessibility, which hopefully you do after watching this conference, just don't be afraid. Just include people with disabilities in the conversation. Yeah. Reach out to the organizations that have spoken here today and just start that process because 
the sooner we start, the sooner we can get to a place where we actually have long-term and sustainable accessibility and we can include people with disabilities in our society long-term, which is ultimately what everyone really wants. Yeah, ultimately what every, everyone wants. Yeah. Um, well, listen, thank you all for your input. Um, it was so useful to kind of hear concrete examples of, you know, how to make transport and the wider world more accessible um, and then get an idea of the hurdles to overcome. And they are unfortunately still many. But um, also get a sense that this is all achievable and in fact it must be achieved um, and that greater awareness of the wider public of the obstacles faced by people with a disability along with the greater commitment and prioritisation by companies, businesses and governments will help to ensure access for everyone everywhere. I'm sure this isn't the end of the conversation and I'll see you in some other fora somewhere else. But thank you again for your time today. Um, so thank you for joining us on Zoom today. And we would be very grateful if you would fill in a post event survey, which will be shared with you later. And as I mentioned, you can rewatch this event again at your leisure, should you wish. And those details will be shared with you on email. And might I suggest that you spread the word about this event and have a conversation with your friends and families about it and maybe send them the link to the conference to watch it at their leisure at the weekend. Um, but by amplifying conversations like today, we really can help with that greater awareness that we spoke about. So um, on behalf of Free Now and Irish Wheelchair Association, I would like to thank Rosemary Kyo, Niall Carson, Jack Kavanagh, Elaine Howley, Ray Coyne, Alan Parker, Fiona Brady, Patrick Flanagan, Christabel Feeney, Fergus Sharp, Maeve Monaghan and Jane Car Joan Carthy and of course all of you at home watching. Thank you so much and Sloan. <laughs>